uh, Health Caring, uh, featuring our own beloved President Lynn Babington. Uh, this is her field of expertise, among many other fields. So uh, I'd like to start with a prayer, and then uh, I'll turn it over to Kamali. Kamali will moderate this uh, session for us. Uh, after President Lynn's presentation, we'll have some time for question and, and answer. And then we'll, um, we'll stop about five minutes to five, and uh, Jeremiah will have a few announcements that uh, he'd like to make at the end. That sound okay? So welcome everybody. Very happy that, uh, that you could join us today. And the prayer that I'd like to use this afternoon is actually inspired by uh, Pope Francis' new encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, on uh, social friendship and uh, fraternity. So um, it's, a, it's a good orientation for us these days. Let us pray. When our lofty words of love have been emptied of their meaning, when our borders and computer screens have erected impenetrable walls, when our minds are so quick to conflate other with enemy, how will we find our common humanity? It's never too late to make an earnest and tender start. May we remove from our pockets the stones we intend to throw and cement them together to build a home that welcomes everyone. May we, we, may we repent of our indifference and move into genuine encounter. Instead of drawing battle lines, may we draw our chairs up at a common table where we can feast in the knowledge of our shared humanity and dignity. May God grant us the holy vision to see in every human being a sacred mystery and may we love each mystery, not abstractly, but concretely. Just as Thomas touched the wounds of Jesus, may we be unafraid to touch the wounds of our suffering neighbors. May we lay down our arms and offer our outstretched hands until there is no more them but only us, until we are at last sisters and brothers together. Amen. So I thought that was a, an appropriate um, prayer, uh, it talks about uh, touching wounds. And I think that's uh, the kind of ministry that um, is, is the a special gift to those in healthcare. So I'd like to turn it over to Kamali now, who will pick it up and lead us uh, going forward. Kamali, welcome. Hi, thank you, Father Marty, and aloha, everyone. Um, again, welcome to today's Share the Joy event, the joy of health caring. We are very delighted to have you with us. Um, so as Father Marty said, my name is Kamila, and I am a senior nursing student here at Chaminade University. And um, I will be moderating today's event, in which we have a very special guest, our very own president, Dr. Lynn Babington. Dr. Lynn Babington is the 10th president of Chaminade University of Honolulu, assuming this position in 2017. Under President Lynn's leadership, Chaminade has expanded its undergraduate, graduate, community programming, and met emerging challenges in higher education with a focus on innovation. At the core of President Babington's philosophy on educational leadership is a conviction that students always come first. In addition to her work at Chaminade, President Lynn volunteers for several boards and organizations. She is a member of Hawaii Business Roundtable, a member of Pacific Asian American Council Board. She participates in the Rotary Club of Honolulu. And before becoming president of Chaminade University, President Lynn served in leadership roles at Fairfield University in Connecticut including a provost and senior vice president for academic affairs. She also spent a number of years at Northeastern University in Boston, where she was an assistant dean for graduate programs and the director for the School of Nursing. Prior to joining academia, President Lynn was a healthcare leader and consultant. From 1999 to 2003, she served as director of clinical programs 
and then CEO at Health Services Partnership in Massachusetts. She also held nursing programs at hospitals in Seattle and San Francisco and was selected as a Fulbright Scholar and a Robert Wood President Lynn received her doctoral degree Washington. President Lynn is married to Dr. Randy Carpenter and has two children, Christian and Caitlin, and one granddaughter, Layla. We are so excited to have you with us today, Dr. <laughs> Bramington. And with a very warm welcome, the floor is all yours. Lynn. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yep, I don't know. Somebody unmuted. Somebody muted me, but thank you so much. It's aloha. It's a pleasure to be here. That bio is way, way, way too long. Can tell how old I am and how many places I've been. But I am uh, very fortunate to have to be at Chaminade now, but also to have had so many wonderful experiences. So what I have the privilege of sharing with you today is a little bit about the joy of caring, the joy of caring in a healthcare setting from a nurse's perspective. Um, I've had wonderful, rich experiences in nursing as a clinical nurse, in multiple settings, um, as a director and manager of nurses uh, on particular units in hospitals. I've run community health centers and major hospitals. And all of those roles have been very different but they've been very similar in that they all call upon what it means to be a nurse and the privilege of being a nurse. Um, we talk a lot about serving others here at Chamana. that's part of our mission. We educate for service, justice, and peace. We educate our graduates to go out into the world and make a difference. Serving others is a wonderful thing and that's part of what nursing is. However, I think nursing is perhaps um, a nuance of that that leads you into a much deeper relationship. It's really accompanying others, walking alongside them, bearing witness to their experiences during their most vulnerable times, from the joy of birth um, to the tragedy of an untimely death. And accompanying someone, being with them um, throughout that um, gives you a unique perspective and it's a true joy and a blessing um, that nurses um, are able to experience in their life. Now, I'm gonna share my screen, uh, mostly because I don't, no one needs to be looking at me. I have some pictures later, but right now, just a few little things. Hopefully this'll, now, can you all see that? Can someone comment? Can you see? Not, just no. yet, Dr. Not yet. Not yet. Did you put share screen, not co-host, but share screen, Jeremiah? Uh, let's see. Nothing. All right, well, hopefully we'll be able to get this because there's so something that I really need to share Lynn, with you later. Lynn? Uh, yeah. Your host has disabled screen sharing, it looks like. I don't know if that's helpful. Okay, can you enable screen sharing? Please, Jeremiah, not the host, but at the very top, it says enable screen sharing and just put yes. Let's see, let me find it, Dr. Bamton. Give me a second here. While you're finding it, um, the first thing I wanted to share was um, a quote from a Canadian physician, Sir William Osler, who founded John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University Hospital here in the United States. And he said, Nothing will sustain you more potently than the power to recognize in your humdrum routine, the poetry of the ordinary man, the toil-worn toil woman with their loves and their joys, their sorrows and their griefs. This is a true gift and a responsibility. It's a responsibility that's somewhat unique to nurses. All health professionals, physicians, therapists, and other supporters of healthcare and um, within hospitals in the community setting have relationships with patients and their families. But nurses typically spend the most time and form the deepest bond with their patients um, as the patients move through the healthcare system. 
Uh, did you figure it out, Jeremiah? Still trying to figure it out, Dr. Babington, sorry. Okay. Oh boy. Okay. All right, well, um, I wanna show you a video, which I'll show you in a little bit that I think I've kind of wanted to kick it off because it does a really nice job of uh, describing or showing um, what I wanted to describe about nursing. Um, Babington, you should be able to share your screen. You're a co-host. No, uh, I, uh, it says that the host has disabled the screen sharing is what it says. So I'm a co-host, but I'm not the host. They, it doesn't matter. Well, I'll go through this and we'll show that at the end. And uh, you know, we need to be flexible, right? So flexibility is always the key. So what I thought I would do now is um, I'm gonna tell you through some experiences that I've had, been privileged to have in my career as a nurse, a few very wonderful experiences I've had that have brought me immense joy, but had a lesson to teach me and a big impact on my own life. Um, and the first I'll start when I was a student. As a student, lots of times nursing students work um, as nursing assistants or nurses aides or whatever you wanna call them in the healthcare setting. I worked in the emergency room of a hospital in downtown Detroit one summer, and it was a great job. I learned lots of things, but one night, uh, Detroit wasn't always the safest place I don't to see be. Where... And one night there was a, uh, a patient came in, uh, two policemen and four gang members all came in who had been shot. And um, we were taking care of these four individuals very quickly. Uh, two of them were very seriously injured, the other two not so much. And while there was a lot of, of chaos going on, um, including somebody pulling out a gun and shooting at the policemen while everyone was trying to care for them, even through all that chaos, the police officers that accompanied these people were just could not believe that we weren't gonna care for the police officers first, who were the two that were not as badly injured. And the, the four perpetrators actually, the gang members who were having fights among themselves as well, um, two of them were very, very ill. And we, you know, the majority of the attention went directly towards those people and got them up to surgery and then, you know, continued to care for everyone there. But I was very young at the time. And I think um, what it helped me to realize is that that's one of the privileges of being a healthcare provider. And one of the responsibilities is we treat all patients equally. It doesn't matter who they are. Uh, we triage in the case of an ER. So you treat the sickest person first with the most care that's required at the time. And it doesn't matter what else has, is going on in, in that person's life. You're attending to the individual in their dire healthcare need at the time. And that was a lesson that it wasn't a surprise for me, but it reinforced to me to actually see it in action and to then have the discussion with the nurse that I was working with, had the discussion very firmly with the police officers who were accompanying this whole mess in the ER of why that is what we do and um, cut the discussion off immediately. And it made me really appreciate um, how important it is to, to really stick with what our commitment as healthcare providers are to do, to heal. Now, apparently I have, um, let's see. Can you see this now? Yes or no? No. 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 Okay. okay. Well, maybe, maybe we won't be able to do that. Okay, then, then the next um, experience, also as a student, I worked in a burn unit at the University of Michigan Medical Center where, where I was a student. And burn, burn units are full of people who have had accidents, 
and a fair amount of abuse as well. Um, you know, every holiday, of course, you would be filled with, this is a total generalization, but it was true, filled with men with burns of their faces because they would throw gasoline on the charcoal to start the fire for the barbecues, right? <laughs> At all. That's different than the baby coming in with cigarette burns up and down their arms. Um, different than the electric, you know, somebody during an electric storm getting uh, electrocuted and burnt. But I cared for one little girl over a whole year's period of time and she was 16 years old and she um, was burned 98% of her body by all means should have died. The only thing that wasn't totally burned was her head because she had a lot of hair and it took a while for the hair to burn. And in that year's time, um, care was a little different than it was now, but the idea of keeping a burn patient alive physically is that you have to keep covered enough of their skin so they can keep keep warmth and that kind of thing and begin to heal and you do skin grafts and it's extremely painful. I won't go through all of that. But I learned more from this little girl than I think I gave to her because I just talked to her through all of the treatments and the debriding and the painful treatments that I was giving her. I talked to her and cried with her and, and listened to her, her challenges. And it was a horrible situation how she got burned anyways and dealt with her whole family as you know they came in and out and it was very dysfunctional. But I realized at that time, the gift of the encounter of being with someone and caring for them, but with them. And um, I don't think that can ever be lost. Now, I never went into psych mental health nursing, but I would say that that experience there taught me more about psych mental health nursing than any experience in an in a inpatient psych unit because she went through every single um, adjustment to her new life situation, um, in, including what could be considered a mental breakdown in that year's period of time. Um, so that, that was one, one thing that really helped me to learn to listen carefully to people. Um, and then I became a nurse and my first job was working at the Medical College of Virginia in a cardiac surgery intensive care unit. They did the very first um, open heart transplants in the country. And, um, uh, and they cared for patients from babies to adults, which doesn't happen now just because there's a lot more technology. Again, I'm dating myself a lot. Um, but one, so we had just wonderful experiences. One of the greatest experiences was one of the first patients I cared for had got a new heart. Uh, heart transplant. And this was a time when you, they didn't have wonderful laminar flow like they have now. So you really isolated people and like the COVID situation, gowned and masks and everything and hardly ever touched this poor person for months and months and months and months till they were able to leave. But to work with that person for all that time and then walk with him out of the hospital with a new heart um, was just an unbelievable experience. And the man that received the heart, received the heart from a, and he was in his forties that received the heart. So young man, um, but he received the heart from a 16 year old who died in a car accident. And he had met his parents um, during the time when he was released from the hospital. And the, you know, the, the beauty of accompanying that man who thought he would die because he spent a year on a heart transplant and he was going through the whole grief of death and dying to be able to then um, accompany him to bringing new life in, into his way of thinking about himself was truly a very special gift for me. Um, and I learned, I learned that to really um, always be hopeful um, and hope is a wonderful thing and to help others, bring hope to others um, through that. And again, that comes sort of from that caring relationship. Another experience in that intensive care unit wasn't quite the, as great of an experience, but um, a little baby, um, newborn, uh, had a, was born with a heart de defect and it, the surgery was unsuccessful. And the, but this was the, 
the baby lived for about five days and then died. And then, you know, we called up the parents to come in. This was a 14 year old mom and the dad, I don't know how old he was, but um, the baby was a crack baby, meaning the mother had been addicted to cocaine at the time. And so the baby had also gone through withdrawal, which is a horrible thing to watch. Um, and the mom had only come in once and the father had never come in. Um, so when I called them to tell, called her to tell her her baby had died, um, she didn't say anything. And, and the, I was working like a three to 11 shift. And at about 10 o'clock, she comes, the mom comes in with the father of the baby, who's another teenager, but a little bit older, it looked like. And they were distraught and crying. Well, this baby had died at four o'clock in the afternoon and was in the morgue by that time, by the time nobody was coming. So I decided that this mom really needed some closure. Um, she herself was in the beginning stages of recovery and none of this was gonna be easier for her. So I asked the head nurse if I could go downstairs to the morgue. Now, if you've ever been to a morgue in a hospital, it's a really creepy place. There's always in the sub sub basement, it's colder than anything. There's, it's never lit very well, at least then. So I made my way down to the morgue because I knew where it was. And um, the person who was outside the morgue, you know, I walked in with him and got this baby who by that time, you can imagine what the baby looked like was cold and blue, et cetera. But I had, don't ask me why, but I had the foresight to bring a bunch of warm blankets because in an intensive care unit, you have blanket warmers. So I had a handful of warm blankets and I brought the baby in the warm blankets outside to the mom and the dad. And I, I let them have a little bit of privacy and hold the baby and for as long as they need to hold the baby to bring some privacy um, for them. And that was a way I thought that I helped them find some peace in dying and maybe began to help those two young people forgive themselves a little bit. Um, it was a tragic um, experience and it just shook me to the core by the time, you know, I politely then took care of everything and they went off on their own. But that was, the, there were very few time periods in your life where you really feel like something um, is really difficult to deal with. That was one for me, but it really taught me the importance of closure. I think closure is important in all kinds of ways, not just in death and tragic deaths, but closure, you know, those of you that are students, you're gonna to have to find closure in graduating <laughs> and moving on. Uh, closure and moving from one portion of your life to, to the next. Uh, you know, I've moved a lot. You heard all those jobs I had. So I've moved a lot. And I think to have good, healthy closure is really important. Um, and you don't always get it right. It's okay not to get everything right all the time, um, but you learn from them. And I think um, learning how to help people find some closure is a very important privilege of caring. And that brought great joy to me, even though it was very painful. Now, during that time, I was quite young and I was gonna get married. So I was into uh, earning all kinds of extra money, like many of you can appreciate, um, to pay for the wedding mostly. So I worked in that intensive care unit during the day sometimes or evening shift. And then I would work about three days a week doing sort of private duty nursing with somebody. And I did this for about eight months, the same young man. And this was a young man, a football player. Um, and he was 16 as well. And he was in a football accident um, and was brain dead. Um, and his family had not given up hope. That's, that's a good thing, I suppose. But this young man was never going to recover. Um, he wasn't going to recover his brain. He was, you know, fine physically, um, but he wasn't going to, oh, he had broken legs and arms, but those healed pretty quickly. So I spent those eight months with that young man and his family, because I would see them either at the beginning or ending of when I was there, um, helping them find peace and find some uh, joy in this young man's the rest of his existence. He wasn't, when I say he was brain dead, 
he wasn't on a ventilator, so he wasn't going to die. He was going to live in a vegetative state for pretty much the rest of his life. Um, and he could move his arms and legs, couldn't walk, but he could, you know, move them if you had, if you, you know, move them with him. But it, this young man was younger than me, and he was such a kind soul. Now, how do I know that? You know, I spent many times, that, a lot of things happen when you're sort of, you think that the brain's not working and it's not. However, physiologically, you can cry, you can laugh um, it, without really having much control over that. So I spent a lot of time talking to this young man about his life and about, um, about his family and about how much his family cared for him. And, and he had a couple of friends that would come in when I was there during the day. Um, and when I left there, I had formed a very close bond with that family because I saw them a lot. And I think they had come to some peace by then. It took a long time. Um, but this, it, it's hard when bad things happen to people and you can't figure it out. And there's no rhyme or reason for it. However, I think in tragedy, there are lessons to learn and there is joy and beauty to be found. And I've always felt like if you can help somebody else find that joy and the beauty, um, or at least move them in that direction, then, then you're providing some, some support. And that's another example of, of something that I learned from the joy of caring for for somebody. Um, another situation is I worked in a VA hospital in San Francisco, again, in a surgical intensive care unit and um, as a critical care nurse. And I spent time with all kinds of second world war patients. Some were first world war that very end um, when those gentlemen were you know, in their nineties and dying. And the stories these guys had to tell were amazing. And the life they lived was amazing, but their inability as a group, inability to recognize finality in the fact that they were gonna die was also pretty amazing. So I, I cannot tell you how many hands I held, how many people I heard their confessions, if you will. I don't mean confessions in a, a, a sense of, of asking for forgiveness, but listening to somebody hear about things they were not proud of in their life, some of them having to do with their experience in the war, some horrible stories about that, um, and, and some other things about family members and regrets they had. And again, um, being with people during their death experience, um, is, is truly a gift and it's a privilege to be able to be there. Much like I'm sure it's probably a privilege to be a, you know, a priest and, and hear people's confessions and have helped them through that reconciliation process. I, wasn't, I was just li letting, listening and letting somebody share their experiences and their grief and their sadness and, um, and their regrets. Um, and that same, sort of thing, um, moved into, you know, I have multiple other jobs in between there, um, but I left clinical nursing and went back and got a master's degree in business and nursing administration and began to run hospitals. And I think, you know, one can say, well, you're not a nurse anymore. As a matter of fact, my mother used to introduce me as she used to be a nurse, but <laughs> And, and some people would say, well, she's the boss of the nurses. But I think um, as a, a, a boss of nurses or if someone leading a hospital, a hospital unit, an entire hospital or healthcare system, I would contend that being a dean, a provost, a president, one of your critical responsibilities is creating a work environment and a healthy and supportive work environment that allows people to find joy in their work. And so I kind of pivoted to that point, um, to not directly caring for patients, although I did do that to some degree, um, but having, making sure that you provide an environment so 
nurses have what they need to care for others. All healthcare people do as far as that goes. Teachers have what they need to teach. Students have what they need to learn. And that you've created an environment that's, that's healthy yeah. and welcomes dialogue and disagreement and discourse. I mean, that's really kind of what we're all about. So there's, you know, there's a chasm between burnout and joy in work and the work we need, we do. But I think we need to, or I always, myself and all the jobs I've had, I'm gonna go back to some stories in a minute. I always come back to what matters. Is this, is, a is this a job that I'm taking that matters, matters to me and is gonna matter to anybody else? Um, and now as, as someone who oversees an environment, what are the impediments to joy for people in their work here? What is it that gets in the way of us finding joy in this work that we do? Um, that includes things like physical safety uh, in this COVID environment, um, physical safety and the environmental safety, but psychological safety, providing people with what the best you can do to make them feel comfortable enough to feel safe in this environment. Those are really important. Um, to me, I've always um, put a strong sense of equity. I think equity in the workplace is important. People need to be, regardless of what your role is, you need to be valued um, and it needs to be fair. Um, camaraderie. I think that people need to find joy in their colleagues. They need the opportunities to develop relationships. Um, I'm all about having some fun too. So I think laughter and fun is a very, very important part of the work we do. It's an important part of our humanity and who we are. Um, so an example of this, maybe from the administrative standpoint is I was in San Francisco um, and worked at San Francisco General Hospital um, at the very beginning of the AIDS epidemic. I was running the hospital um, from the patient care perspective. So um, that was a tough time. Nobody really knew what this disease was all about. Everybody was afraid they were gonna get it by breathing air from somebody with AIDS. And then it was AIDS, it wasn't even called HIV at the time. And the patients were ignored, stuck in the corner, put in isolation. Um, and then there was the whole overlaying issue of, well, this is a gay man's disease and therefore, you know, it's their fault that some of that came into being. And also families couldn't quite get their heads wrapped around the fact that their son might be dying and the son has a partner that wants to see him. And there were all kinds of issues and fights like that. So um, I developed the first AIDS unit, inpatient AIDS unit and community clinics throughout the San Francisco area with a wonderful group of people, including I might add our biggest advocates within the community in San Francisco was the Catholic Church there. The cathedral there was a source of respite and hope for these young men, particularly those who um, don't uh, have families in the area. And that was extremely helpful um, in, in launching this initiative to, first of all, provide dignity and death, because at that time, every single person that entered that age unit died. They, you, they didn't, you know, they don't die of AIDS. You die of a, some other condition, usually pneumonia or heart failure and or as some horrible cancer that's untreated. Um, but dignity in dying and working with families to recognize that the majority of these young men had partners and their partners needed the closure of saying goodbye. Um, and that was a tough thing to work through. And I learned so much there because I was young and uh, idealistic and it was hard for me to understand why a parent wouldn't let their son see the partner they've been with for years to say goodbye. I didn't get that at all. And it took me, it took some real mentoring for me to understand where people were coming from and how to help. Some people never worked past that. Um, and then you work with a patient and helping them recognize that 
they weren't going to be able to um, have that closure. It's different now. We have iPhones. We have FaceTime. We, you know, they, even if somebody said you couldn't come in, you could figure it out. But that wasn't the case then. And I learned a lot about myself then. I learned about my own biases and, uh, and the fact that you have to be open to other people's viewpoints, even if you vehemently disagree with them, unless it's a matter of life and death, you have to be open to them. Um, I learned this lesson when I was teaching once. I remember teaching a public health class in North Carolina, and we were talking about um, uh, HIV women who had HIV, not AIDS now, and were being treated for their HIV, whether or not they had the right to get pregnant and give birth. Because at that time, most of those babies were born with HIV. Not true now at all, but at that time it was true. And we had a debate in a class and, you know, uh, it doesn't matter what my viewpoint was. Listening to other people's viewpoints and recognizing that there's validity to a completely different viewpoint than yours, um, is important. And as a teacher, I was the teacher then, my role was to help those young nursing students recognize that it's not all about you. You've got to be with the patient, with the person where they are at that time making their decision. And you have to respect the decisions they make, even if you disagree with them. Um, that's a good lesson to learn, I think, in life. Now, unfortunately, I have some fabulous pictures I wanted to show you. I'm going to try this one more time. Any luck? No. All right, you would have said something. Uh, well, I am a little bit disappointed because it's a great video clip. But I also had a lot of pictures I was going to show you of the last experience that I'll uh, show you with us. I've spent about 20 years um, as part of an organization called Intercultural Nursing. And it's a group of nurses who um, run uh, health clinics in, uh, in the Dominican Republic and Haiti on the Haitian border um, in what's called no man's land. And we've, I haven't done that since I've been here, of course, but I um, did it for a long time. And this is a nonprofit organization. And we take all our own supplies and the Catholic church supports us there by providing drivers. We drive to the end, organizing the different villages that we would go to rural areas and we would set up healthcare clinics and um, treat people. And we ran sustainable clinics insofar as we provided um, uh, health, community health worker education and provided ongoing hypertension clinics and vaccination clinics um, throughout the years. This group went four times a year from four different universities. And I took a group from Northeastern for years, even when I wasn't at Northeastern. But what I learned there is um, sometimes you saw people um, that they were sick. They you know, had colds, the flu, um, horrible things because healthcare in, at different time periods was worse than others. The further away you are from the major cities, the less you count, because it's all about your vote. And if you don't vote, you don't count. So we were in an area, strip of land on the river separates Haiti from the Dominican Republic. And this group of people, um, they didn't have birth certificates. So therefore they weren't able to vote because most people had their babies at home. And so they didn't count. So therefore their roads were bad and the water and sanitation, et cetera, et cetera. So sometimes you would go there and the, especially the rainy season, it would be, people would be very sick. But a lot of people came, moms would come and they would rattle off this list of um, symptoms, none of which you knew was true because you're looking at them for them or their children. And what they really, um, wanted to do uh, was to stockpile some medications for when they needed them. Now, when I'm talking about meds, we would never give antibiotics unless somebody was really sick. And we had nurse practitioners doing that. But we had Tylenol and ibuprofen and vitamins and stuff like that. Um, and the first, when I first got there, I thought, well, now, you know, they shouldn't be doing that. They don't really need this. And very quickly, I realized that, heck, I'm a mom. 
if it's a, I'm going to see these people once or twice a year, I certainly am going to get the Tylenol I'm going to need for when they're not there, right? Um, and that's, so that was an important conversation to have with people. But then much later, I was talking with a woman once, and I realized that these people, what we gave them wasn't health care, although sometimes we did give tremendous health care, but we gave them recognition of their humanity that they counted, that they were worthy enough that a group of nurses would come several times a year and sit with them and hear their stories and hold their babies and talk to them about their life and give them the Tylenol and what other kind of things you can do. But there's huge value in recognizing the humanity of people. And that's a lesson that every single group that we took, you would sit in the evening and do, do this reflection and people would say, oh, they couldn't understand this or that. And that's something that those of us who had been doing this a while had to continue to, to comment on um, the importance of doing that. Um, you know, somebody just emailed me and said that it might be a good idea if I try to email this to Jeremiah. So I'm going to quickly uh, email Jeremiah this PowerPoint and maybe he can show it since I can't seem to do it. Thanks, Dr. Babington. The other thing too, uh, so I made you co I made you co-host and then your host right now. Um, you'll have to make me host again. Maybe uh, we're trying to figure it out. It may be a setting on your computer. Uh, so if you make well, me I host just, again. The only reason I, I don't know why is I um, presented something yesterday <laughs> and I no, shared no. and I didn't have any trouble on Zoom. Shucks. So. It's the little uh, gremlins in the internet. They just kind of mess things <laughs> up every once in a while. Yeah. This is kind of the first time I've had this. Um, Us I've as had well. It. Us as well. How special are we? We get, we get you, <laughs> our, our president, and we have all these fun things to adapt and change with. So we're going to make the best of it. But it's been great so okay. far. Well, I had wonderful photos to show because it's always nice to look at photos. And the children um, you know, that I worked with through all those years. And I was there for long enough that first you took photos with, you know, like this was prior to cell phones with like a film and had them developed and used to bring the photos. So I remember uh, the last time I was there right before I came here. So about four years ago, I brought all these photos and I delivered the photos to some of the parents now, but some kids who I knew when they were just infants and watching them through the years grow up and they were just thrilled to see those. It's different now because everybody's got cell phones. They have burner cell phones there too. So the picture thing's not so, such a big deal, but it was a really big deal back then. Um, but so I think at the end of the day, the most important thing is um, for me as a nurse is the joy of accompanying people, the joy of and privilege of being invited into someone's life. And I call that the caring aspect. Um, there's joy in all kinds of work. Um, and how do we know there's joy in our work? Well, from my perspective, if we're grateful for our work, there's joy in our work. If there's hope, if it's hopeful work, if there's an awareness of abundance, I don't mean abundance with money or anything, but abundance of people of gifts that we have to give. And if we receive it, this is all my viewpoint now, it might not be yours, deep satisfaction from serving others. Those are things that help me find joy in work. Um, and I find certainly have found joy in the work here um, for, all, for all those reasons. I'm completely hopeful about Shamanad and about the, I'm hopeful in our future with this bright young group of of students that I meet every single day. And I'm so grateful to our students and our faculty and staff for all they do to support our um, students' education. And I find an abundance of love and of happiness here. So that satisfies me deeply. 
So the last thing that I was going to um, kind of end with was I am an academic, right? So you have to give a little bit of share with you. The, the nursing faculty on this and Amber perhaps will get it. Um, the theoretical construct of caring, okay? So, so what caring is, is um, it's a reflective way of being. Um, it's openness, sensitivity, empathy, the ability to communicate is confidence, courage and professionalism, and showing respect and supporting dignity. So that's what describes caring. The attributes of caring are um, three things. Being there, the uniqueness of a relationship, each caring relationship is unique, and mutuality. It has to be two ways. Um, and the consequence of a caring relationship is the encounter influences both parties. So in the case of a health caring relationship, both the patient and the nurse are influenced greatly by the encounter. That's a caring encounter. That's different than doing something for somebody. That's the real relationship. Now that's what you learn as a nurse, um, our faculty and, clinical mentors model that all the time. And those of you that are nursing students, you're beginning or there, and you certainly will be as you continue, um, continue in this just wonderful role of caring for others with others. Um, so I guess I'll end with a bit of advice. Uh, find joy in your work and your life by surrounding yourself with others who share your passion and support each other. Um, we can all accomplish a lot if we truly believe in what we're doing. And for me, that's been the most important thing in my life. And I will say that's what I took from nursing. Um, and I'm still a nurse. It's just my patient population's a bit different. Um, so uh, thank you for listening. Um, I. Somehow I'll share with you that wonderful video. My pictures are pretty great too, but the video is a very special video and I'll certainly share it with the nursing students because it's a good one. Um, so I think it's a great opportunity now for me to take questions so we can stay on time. Any questions? Let's see the chat. I have a question, Lynn. Yes. But you are an educator and the nurse so what do you see? And I already hear a lot from your uh, very rich life analogies, but what would you say, uh, like few features um, common for um, teaching and nursing profession? Okay, um, I, I think the, the mutuality piece of it, I think the, the, a, a relationship between a teacher, a professor and a student, um, it becomes a special relationship when there's mutual concern and care for the, the knowledge that you're sharing. I know you as a professor learn as much from your students as you impart on them. Um, you might learn something personal about a person, but you also learn a lot about what it is you're teaching um, by how you teach and how it's received. Um, I think there's a lot of similarities. Um, you have a, a obligation and you have a privilege to have an influence on some young person's life um, or somebody's life, doesn't need to be a young person, can be someone older than you. And that, that's a privilege, but with that comes a responsibility that, that you, you impart that knowledge and you, you teach in a very thoughtful and caring way. Um, but I think that's probably the, the most similarities. They're very similar. Good question. Any other questions? President Lynn, I was, um, I was curious about what you found as the biggest disappointment or challenge in your career as in, in nursing, um, something that you wanted to do and was not able to do or, or something like that. Mm. That's in other words, you, you, you've given us a lot of really beautiful stories, but I know that all of them probably didn't end so well. No, I'll, I'll give you two. 
Um, one, I was the um, administrator of a small Catholic hospital in uh, Seattle, Washington, St. Cabrini Hospital. And it uh, specialized in psych mental health. There were like five different psych mental health units as well as geriatric care. And, but didn't have pediatrics or obstetrics, did a little bit of surgery, a little bit of medicine. But, um, and then during the times where the economics of healthcare got more challenging, a lot of mergers and acquisitions happened. And I worked with this board uh, for the hospital and they, they needed to close the hospital and they wouldn't sell it. And they were the Sisters of Providence wanted to buy it, a local nonprofit, two local nonprofit hospitals, and they just wouldn't sell it for a whole bunch of reasons. And I felt like, you know, I was the person that was trying to push that. Um, and I spent many, many hours both in Seattle and going to Chicago to try to get that board to understand and see what they were giving up. Uh, well, they closed the hospital and the closure was difficult, but I spent a year closing it and outsourcing, not outsourcing, but helping other people find jobs. And we had a huge celebration in a good way. That part ended well, but I felt like I totally failed because they ended up leveling the hospital and building a medical incinerator, which they made more money at. But the chapel of the hospital was the home of the orphanage where St. Cabrini's had in the United States. And they leveled it and made it an incinerator. And I took a lot, I, I felt that was failure on my part. You know, I don't know, I did the best I could. Um, and I don't know if I could have done anything else, but I felt like I failed then. Um, let's see, I had another whammy one. Oh, I quit a job once. I had a really wonderful job, but, um, and it was, I was the, vice president for nursing, which is the chief nurse at a hospital. I won't even name the city or the hospital. And it was during a lot of pay, uh, did a lot of different cuts, the same time period actually, right before that other one. So I had two bad ones in a row. And um, I then was asked to make staffing cuts that uh, I wouldn't do because I thought it would jeopardize patient care. And I spent a lot of time and a lot of soul searching over this and tried to come up with different alternatives, tried to change my mind and th think, yeah, you really could do that. And I knew it wasn't right. And it wasn't, it wasn't, I couldn't do that. So I quit my job, always wondering if it would have been better to stay there and try to salvage it. I don't know the answer to that. So those are two pretty big mess ups. I mean, you can, you can make a mistake by giving a wrong medication and, and by all means, everybody's done that. <clears throat> Actually, I don't think I gave a wrong medication, but you can forget to chart it or give it at the wrong time or something like that. But um, right away, you can remedy that. But you know, you can't remedy some of these other things. Um, and, but I think I, the lesson to be learned is we do the best we can um, and certainly get help if you're ever in over your head. And believe me, in both those circumstances, I had a lot of help to help me through them to, to make the, that right decision. But um, disappointments, yeah, you have disappointments, but like I said, um, you find work that you find joy in and those attributes of joy are critically important to the work. And when the, it no longer is providing you that with that time when I felt like I was jeopardizing patient care, then it was up to me to leave, even though it was a good job. All right, one more minute. We're gonna stay on time. <laughs> Dr. Babington, I have a question for you. Um, first of all, thank you so much for sharing with us today. I'm so deeply sorry that you weren't able to share your screen with us. And I really hope that we'll be able to see the video and the pictures, um, but you talked a lot about, you know, the pain that comes along with nursing, but also how that pain transforms into joy. You know, we do this um, so that we can help other people in their darkest moments, their most difficult and troubling times. And um, you talked about the importance of it and you know having camaraderie and finding things that you love and enjoy. I wanted to ask you, how do you um, find closure personally? Like what are, what are your tactics? What advice can you offer to the nursing students in the room um, as far as that goes? Uh, uh, closure with a patient relationship? 
that's one thing. And you'll learn that you'll have lots of experiences in that in discharging people and sending them off into the world happy most of the time. I shared with you a lot of sad, but happy most of the time. I think when you're looking for your first job, important to look at the, the unit that you're uh, applying for and interviewing with some of the people and finding out what it's like to be there. Um, you know, I'd like to say all nursing units are good and all groups of nurses you know, it's a really nice, good environment. It's not. That's what my doctoral work was actually in, a whole nother issue about organizational environments. I personally think it's really important that you work in an environment where the teamwork and mutual respect for the value each individual brings to the team in the interprofessional work is critically important. And when you see that, and you can see it, it's palpable. And though, and those of you that have been in multiple clinical experiences, I'm sure you can you can tell when you walk on a unit and talk to people if this is a good place to work. Um, I think that's that's really important as well. So, I mean, you do need to have closure in an individual one-on-one -on -one relationship with a patient. Um, and, and that's never easy if it's a, but it's so gratifying on all levels that you just learn to deal with that. But, you know, I moved a lot and it was always important for me to have good, healthy closure before I left a, a, a particular job I had. Um, but I would always look for the job where it looked like people worked well together, respected each other, and there was real interprofessionalism to, to the care that was going on there. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Babington. And um, I, my responsibility is to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, so unless anyone has any other questions, I'd like to open up the floor for any announcements. And again, another round of applause and thank you. Thank you so much to Dr. Babington. Um, if you have any questions, I'm sure Dr. Babington would be willing to answer them via email or you can- um, Stop by my office. Always love to have visitors. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I just may add real quick too, if uh, anyone is interested in getting Dr. Babington's presentation, you could email us and we can make sure uh, to try to get that to you. We're also trying to take a little screenshot of uh, the participants' names so that we can have everyone uh, tr hopefully try to get those out to you and include that great video that's in there as well. Dr. Okay. Babington, before you sign off, if you could uh, just make me host uh, again before signing off. Um, and that would be that would be great. So again, for anyone that wants uh, Dr. Babington's presentation, uh, if she's okay with that, we can email yeah, that yeah. to you. But yeah, just... I'll send it to you. There we go. Wonderful. <clears throat>
Um, our next share the joy is the joy of change, and that's going to be with our counseling department um, at uh, 4 p.m. same room. Um, also, next week is the Taste of Culture. That's going to happen from 6 to 8 p.m. All the students are invited, students, faculty, and staff. They're going to have dishes from around the world, and they're making sure everything's prepackaged. So come check that out, too. It's a really fun event. And then the co-curricular awards are coming up. So if you have any nominations, nominations um, went out. Um, so please check that out. Um, you can check the QR code as well. Um, the Marianist Leadership Center has a uh, workshop with 